Hello, everyone. I am Lucy Keller from Historic Beverly. First, I'm going to give you a basic introduction on this Spotlight presentation. Historic Beverly's Spotlight Talks are brief, informal presentations on objects from the Historic Beverly Collection. During the talk, I will be switching between viewing the object and sharing some slides. I will try to let you know when I am about to switch because there may be a slight delay during transitions. Now I'm gonna switch over to today's object. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about this Chickering piano we have on display in the parlor here at Cabot House. I will also be sharing with you some of the piano's finer details on the slides later. First, I'm going to start with some basic historical context about parlors and musical instruments. Visitors to the house would have been brought into this room to converse with whomever they were visiting. In the 18th and 19th centuries, it was an achievement to have a parlor room because it was a marker of your social status, evidence that you had risen above the majority who lived in one or two room only homes. The parlor, which derives from the French word parler, which means to speak, would have been considered a reception room. This room would have been decorated to dazzle with opulence, wealth, and luxury. Its purpose was to showcase the family and their social status and to create a spectacular first impression. Musical instruments have long been a symbol of education, wealth, and prominence. Until the late 1800s or early 1900s, they were very costly so not many people could afford to buy them. Instruments would often be on display in the parlor of a home, even if they weren't in use. Music was a major form of entertainment during the 18th and 19th centuries. All young ladies of a certain social status and society ladies were expected to have a certain number of accomplishments to their credit. Music was one of those expected accomplishments. Playing a musical instrument of some sort or singing was practically a required social asset. Often during gatherings or when there were visitors, the ladies were expected to display their musical skills. Now a little bit about this chickering piano. This piano was custom built by Chickering and Sons for Mary Bridges Brown. She was the second wife of Moses Brown, who served under General Glover in the American Revolution and was the first president of the Beverly Bank. As a society lady, Mary Brown would have been expected to play on special occasions or during social gatherings to display her skill. The piano is made of maple, and has a rosewood veneer. Note that this keyboard is quite different from those pianos we use today. Most of today's pianos have 88 keys. This has a much shorter keyboard. There are only 43 keys on this piano. While we don't know exactly what this piano cost, the average cost for a piano in 1850 would be roughly $5,500 in today's dollars. Now I'm going to switch over to the slides to give you a closer look at some of the details. There's a slight delay. As you can see in this picture, the legs and some of the panels and along the edges are decorated with a gilded bronze inlay known as ormolu, which is French for ground gold. To create this effect, a mixture of gold and mercury 
was applied to either bronze or brass surfaces and then heated. The heating process would displace the mercury and would leave behind a thin layer of gold. This was an extremely expensive process. And as you can imagine, given what we know about mercury today, it was very unhealthy work for the artisan. Here are some close-ups of the ornate craftsmanship of the piano. The legs are quite elaborately, elaborately carved, as you can see in these pictures. You can also see some of the ormolu detail in this band here. These are other close-ups of some of the other finer details. On the left, you can see part of the ormolu inlay. On the right is one of the intricately carved inlays on the piano's top. This shows you part of the inside of the piano. The picture on the left shows most of the strings and their placement above the soundboard. The right gives you a close-up of the strings. The 43 keys of this piano were made of ivory. This piano was last tuned over five years ago. And at that time, the piano tuner said that the piano still seemed to hold tune very well, and it should be occasionally played to keep in tune. Listen to the tone of the piano. It is just slightly off pitch in a couple of the notes. Considering its age, over 190 years old, when it was last tuned, over five years ago, the fact that it isn't played regularly and the lack of heat Cabot House suffered in late 2018, it still sounds remarkably well, and at least a few of the keys in the middle range, middle C to F, remain fairly close to pitch. One of the unusual details to which a modern eye might be drawn is the harp-shaped foot pedals. Quite different from our foot pedals of today, which are typically much more utilitarian. This is the brass plate that is mounted above the keys. It reads J. Chickering Maker, 20 Common Street, Boston. This piano was made by Chickering and Sons in 1828 when they were located at Common Street in Boston, Massachusetts. This and the next three slides show objects from the historic New England collection. Shown here is an undated trade card for the company. Similar to today's business cards, trade cards were used for advertising. Notice their centered logo, which resembles the harp-shaped foot pedals I pointed out earlier. The company was founded in 1823 and was known for making award-winning instruments of superb quality and intricate design. One of the founders, Jonas Chickering, is known for making several major contributions to the development of piano technology. These allowed for better sound, safer weight distribution, and space-saving aspects. These technological advancements are still in use to this day in modern piano construction. By the middle of the 19th century, Chickering was the largest piano manufacturer in the United States and was acclaimed worldwide. On December 1st, 1852, a massive fire destroyed Chickering's piano factory that was then located at 336 Washington Street in Boston. The piano factory was relocated 
and rebuilt in 1853 at 79 Tremont Street in Boston. This is an advertisement for the business ware rooms of Chickering and Sons on Tremont Street in Boston. There, they shared the location with a Masonic temple, as you can see in this advertisement. This advertisement is from the 1856 Almanac. In 1867, Jonas Chickering's son, Frank, was awarded the Imperial Cross of the Legion of Honor by Emperor Napoleon III for services to the art of music. At the time, it was one of the most prestigious non-military awards in the world. This was just one of over 200 awards the country amassed throughout its history. By 1870, Steinway had surpassed Chickering and Sons as the largest piano manufacturer in America. This ad is from an 1880 advertising booklet where chickering models are described with text and illustrations. Testimonials and prizes are included. The last page has an illustration of the piano manufactory on Tremont Street in Boston. This ad for the Corey Brothers shows the Chickering and Sons Rhode Island agents who were then located at 131 Westminster Street in Providence, Rhode Island. The company also owned and operated several concert halls around the nation. They were concentrated here in the Northeast, primarily in New York City and Boston. This circa early 1900s postcard is of Chickering Hall, located on Huntington Avenue in Boston. This is where Oscar Wilde's first lecture in America was held. Throughout a series of mergers that began in 1908, the company continued operations until 1983. This shows another Chickering piano that can be found in the historic Beverly Collection. This piano is on display in the parlor at Hale Farm. Please come see Mary Bridges Brown's piano in its setting at the Cabot House to get the full effect. If you'd like to learn about the portraits above the piano, watch for our spotlight talk on the Brown portraits. If you have any questions, you can contact us at research at historicbeverly.net. For this talk, talk, we researched images on the Historic New England website listed here on this page, as well as images from the Historic Beverly Collection. Those links are shown here. You can follow us at Historic Beverly on Facebook or Historic Beverly on Instagram to find out about other programs, spotlight talks, and events coming up. Thank you for attending this spotlight talk. Please check our website at www.historicbeverly.net for upcoming events, exhibits, programs, including children's programs, and our walking tours. We have something for just about everyone. You can also follow us as mentioned on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of our programs soon.